Hey folks, my name is Will Jarvis. Along with my dad, Dr. David Jarvis, we record the podcast Narratives. Narratives is a project exploring stories about progress. In what ways are we better off now than in the past? Are there ways that we are worse off? What is the ideal future? How do we build it? Join us as we explore these questions with some of the brightest minds in the world. Hey folks, this week on the podcast, we've got David Smith. David Smith is a well-known computer scientist. I hope you enjoy his stories from the early days of computing and his vision of the future for personal computing, augmented reality, and the role computing will play in our lives in the coming century. David is now the CEO of Croquet. I believe Croquet is the future of collaboration on the internet. And with that, here's the episode. So, hey, folks, today on the podcast, we've got David Smith and um, David Smith and I are out here on uh, my porch. It's kind of a cool late November evening. It's nice out. And um, David Smith, uh, I I met him because he's a good friend of someone else we had on the podcast. He's uh, he's Eric Smith's dad, as a matter of fact. Yeah, I guess that's a kind of friend. Yeah, kind of friend. Right. Uh, So uh, and, and David, you helped found Tonjo originally. Okay. Yeah, it was kind of got um, Eric going. The original idea was mine. Nice. And I convinced uh, Eric to um, start building on top of of that. I was, um, you know, trying to figure out how to um, uh, get a company started. And he, um, I think, he kind of started even before he graduated. Uh, but he's been pretty focused on it for ever, ever, ever since. Sure of course, the original idea was very different from where you are today, but it was, uh, I still think that idea is pretty cool, and I'd love to see that come to life someday. Definitely, yeah, things kind of iterate over time. Yep, they do. And you, so you've been an entrepreneur and computer scientist for quite a while, is that correct? Yeah, um, I was, uh, oh my gosh, uh, I, when I graduated from, from college, I was lucky enough to get an incredibly great job um, working at uh, a company called Thermo Electron, uh, I was literally a corporate analyst working for the CEO of that company. Oh wow! It, it was uh, they were Fortune two, Fortune seven hundred at the time. I think they're like Fortune two hundred now. They're ther- they're called Thermo Fisher now. They actually have oh a, really yeah they they have a a site here in in North Carolina. The Research yeah, Triangle. yeah. My uh, sister is a quality control scientist at Thermo Fisher. Yeah, yeah. I worked for George Hitsopoulos and his wife Daphne Hitsopoulos oh, wow. in their. Um, Oh gosh, what was that group called? Um, it, it was is basically the well, it's analysis. We we did all the uh, software to help George run the company. Wow! Actually. So that's where I first got. Uh, I, I I actually when I graduated from from college, I did not know how to program. Really? No. Uh, I was I went to University of Chicago. They didn't have a computer science program at the it's time. Too early. Yeah, and then um, what happened was. I had a degree in mathematics, and I I wound up going to Boston. Uh, my my girlfriend at the time was going to go to MIT to get her PhD, so I moved out there with her. And I was my my intent was to get into to AI, artificial intelligence, and so um, but you know obviously I needed a real job as well, and so I applied to. Oh, at least a hundred different companies. Oh, wow. back, back then, the way it worked is you wrote a letter. Oh wow! And, and included <laughs> your resume, and and uh, and it was about two months, I think, before. I mean, I just got rejections after rejections. Oh, I still have them. I, I, oh, I that's keep awesome. Them around. I, I think it's important <laughs> to have have that. Uh, you know, make sure your ego yeah. doesn't get ahead of you. Uh, so I, every so often, I, I every over the years, I've taken a look at them, and uh, yeah, but. Um, but I got it. Was, it was actually uh, I was very worried because I thought, oh wow, I'm never going to get a job doing what I want to do, and so I was thinking, oh maybe I have to go to the Navy or something. Yeah. Uh, and um, but the crazy thing was, I I literally got two job offers uh, almost the same day. Oh wow! Uh, after two months of rejections, and. Um, and I, I always wonder what would have happened if I'd gone the other path, because uh, they were both very interesting. Yeah. Um, one, uh, the the one I chose not to go with was a 
also a kind of a startup versus the bigger company I went with that was doing financial uh, modeling, um, uh, basically stock uh, stock modeling, uh, running on an Apple II. Oh, wow. Which in those days was kind of new. Uh, this was before the Mac. Uh, and uh, that would have been a fascinating job. Definitely. Uh, I really um, kind of... Uh, you know, it's like it's one of those things you, you, you have these forks in the road. That was such a clear one. Right. Because I would have gotten involved with personal computing a lot earlier. On the other side, uh, when I wound up going to the corporate uh, world uh, with Thermo Electron, I got a dream job. It was just, uh, you know, very, very, uh, very visible uh, and working for um, two people that were just uh, wonderful. Uh, George Hitsopoulos, who was the founder of Thermo Electron. And Daphne Hitsopoulos' his wife, she was, as I said, she ran the uh, analytics group and um, was really great uh, was they were programming in a language called APL. APL actually stands for a programming language <laughs> in, invented by Ken Iverson. Uh, but what was magic about that language was it was very much a... Um, uh, an array centric or mathematical centric gotcha. l language so it, it really cor uh, it really uh, uh, resonated with the way I thought and in fact I'd say it's, it's certainly one of the most powerful languages even today and people don't use it much because it's pretty uh, cryptic gotcha. know, it's a language that is a little hard to read uh, we, we used to call it a write only language because <laughs> even the people who wrote it could ne not necessarily read it but the power of that language was so, so incredible. Uh, what what I wound up doing was building a, uh, a a new kind of spreadsheet that was this is this is one of the great things about that job is it was one of the first collaborative platforms ever built because George was using it to run the company and uh, those days and even today uh, Thermo was uh, built out of divisions. Uh, he had a number of presidents that reported into him. And so each of those presidents managed a spreadsheet that was their business. And then uh, all that information in that spreadsheet got collated into George's master spreadsheet. Gotcha. So he could actually do a slice through. The, it was a cube of information. You imagine here's the company, here's the time, and here's the various parts of the business. And so you could slice this thing. So we actually called this, this super spreadsheet cube. And uh, George used it to... Um, understand his businesses, how it compare them. Um, it was all running on an IBM 4341 mainframe. And, uh, and that's how we were able to do the collaboration because uh, it was all on the same computer. Gotcha. You know, the, the personal computing, the idea of networking on com personal computing uh, wasn't around in common use at that point. Uh, and for that matter, personal computing really wasn't much of a thing in, corporate, in the corporate world. Uh, it did, by the way, networking did exist at places like Xerox Park, and that's a, that's part of the discussion later because that's I, I got involved with that crowd. But uh, what was really wonderful was this ability to uh, have an organization have a common perspective on information and be able to, you know. Uh, you know, shift their perspective on what was going on and explore that. And it was obviously a feedback loop. So George right. would say, oh, what's going on here? He'd get back in touch with his, his team, and then uh, we'd have that iteration. So I, I was responsible for, uh, I'd say, the majority of that system. It, it was kind of in progress when I got there. And bear in mind, I had never programmed before. <laughs> so I, I, on the fly. I, they, they really brought me up to speed. And it was actually a really fascinating thing because I – I'd done a little bit of, what was it back then, Pascal, I guess? And, um, but, you know, nothing, uh, you know, it was like doing st you know, stupid homework assignments or something. Right, it wasn't right. a real project. And so I, I, I had this way of thinking about it as, okay, you have loops and you have this sort of, and I went to uh, one of the guys who was sort of mentoring me, and I showed him this code, and it was like, oh, God, 50 lines of code. Yeah. And he uh, said, you're thinking wrong. And he said, and he showed me something. He showed me all the stuff I had done in, in APL. Not a lot of languages work this way, but APL did, where it compressed into this one line. Oh, wow. And, I, and it was like, bam, I got like, 
it was slap in the face is like, oh, this is magic. You right. Know? And I, I never looked back because it, once I got that little hint, I understood this idea of, of mapping uh, information across vectors and arrays and matrices. And uh, it, was, it was marvelous. It was absolutely uh, incredible. Um, and, and so that, that's really where I got started thinking about um, the nature of, uh, of, of languages and collaboration a, as, a, as a thing. Uh, so so that, that, was, that was a huge thing for me. And then, um, but I was still had this fascination with artificial intelligence. Right. So I, I was a, um, when I was in college, I worked in a brain research lab, and we, uh, we were doing uh, research into um, multiple sclerosis, I think. And um, what we're trying to do was find the sort of, do cultures of lamb brains, and, you know, literally once a week or so, We'd go, we'd go to the butcher shop in Chicago oh, and wow. buy brains. Oh, wow. Uh, lamb brains, of course. Yeah. And, uh, and then we'd go into the lab and we'd scrape off the gray matter and, and put those in culture. And we'd basic, basically be watching them in culture to figure out, you know, kind of what would cause uh, the, the failure that we saw. Interesting. And, um, uh, w but it was really clear to me uh, that the, the biological model of how to, to understand the brain was, I, I kind of realized you can't get there right. do, doing that. that. That's not true today, by the way, but you know, this is 40 years ago. And, uh, and, and so that's why I kind of started thinking the right way to do it is where a, 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 a kind of science where you can actually have control right. of the system, which is what brought me to AI. I thought, okay, the only way you're going to understand the brain is create a model of the brain that a human can actually uh, create and understand and iterate with versus trying to look at gray goo on a slide. Right. And that uh, was uh, a, a second turning point. So I got extraordinarily lucky right out of college, got this wonderful job. Uh, the second thing was I went to a, a class that was being taught at Boston University, uh, Lucia Vina. Uh, was was teaching it, and um, and it was a, you know, it was AI, and I I was, you know, I fascinated. And I went up to talk to her afterwards, and it was like I was pretty excited about what yeah. she was doing, and she and and it turned out she was starting a company to do, uh, use use AI for understanding uh, a, 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 a diagnosing and treating brain damage. Oh wow, and. So I was really interested in that. I mean, that's sort of like the crossing of the two things. Right. I was interested in AI and, and brain. And so uh, I wound up working with her, sort of weird part-time thing. I, I would like work my, my full time at, at Thermo and then I'd go work with her over the weekends. Nice. And so I was, it was insane. I was working 100 hour weeks. Yeah. Uh, but it was, it was incredible because uh, I wound up working she had she one of her friends uh, was Richard Greenblatt. Richard, uh, it was one of the real pioneers of, of AI. He invented a machine called the Lisp machine, uh, which was a computer designed just to run Lisp uh, uh, and, and do AI. Uh, and um, and so we he was hosting this new company at Lisp Machine Incorporated, oh, wow. and, and so I wound up going to you know a, a computer manufacturing company and i had an office there and i was just i was working there for them uh exploring you know bi building it, it was an interesting hybrid because the idea was we'd use apple twos as the interface to the people with brain damage and then we'd use the list machines as sort of an expert system for the diagnosis side and um uh, and that was just wonderful um being able to I, 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 I sort of exploded in productivity because I was building a new, we call it, they were kind of like games. We tried gotcha. to make them like games so that people could get that, make it really simple interface, make it yeah. really fun. And, um, and that's, um, so that's how I got into the AI side. And, and that was really um, uh, invaluable. Um, 
so what happened, I did that for, oh, months, months. Uh, I don't remember how long, but ultimately I just, I, I, I decided I just wanted to do the AI stuff. Gotcha. And so I, 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 I uh, Lucia and Richard uh, offered me a full-time job and I left uh, Thermo. And, uh, and so I, I started doing that. About the same time, I heard that Apple had a new computer coming out. So this would have been 83. Yeah. 1983. Uh, how long ago is that? Oh, man. <laughs> I mean, 37 <laughs> years ago. Yeah, a while uh, back. And uh, I was like, I, I, I'm just, I was fascinating, yeah. fascinated with, with, with what that was. I mean, I've been spending, uh, you know, my full-time job was programming yeah. Apple IIs and list machines. And so a new computer that was really going to be quite different. No one knew much about it. So I um, went into one of the com computer stores, uh, Journal Computing, I think it was called, in Boston. And I said, I want the first new co Apple computer that comes in. And I put cool. $1,000 down on it and said, I want the very first one you get. And so um, no one knew that every store was only going to get one. <laughs> But they called me. They were really very, I mean, they did what I asked. They yeah. called me and said, your computer's here. Yeah. And, then, and they didn't even ask to keep it for a while because they, they literally had nothing to show if they gave me that computer. Right. But I didn't care. I took it anyway. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> uh, and so I had uh, probably the first Macintosh in Boston that actually got bought. I mean, people oh, wow. in the area had earlier ones. Like demo units but, and stuff. But that was the very first one. That was February 11th, 1984. And I know why that's that date, because that was my birthday. Nice. Um, and I carried it out. And what I did was I brought it over to LMI. Now, those machines were uh, kind of these super workstations. Uh, they were bitmap displays. They used gotcha. a mouse. Uh, they were quite powerful. But then I pull out this Macintosh, and this Macintosh has a bitmap display. It has a mouse. It's not quite as fast as the list machine was, but it was not too shabby either. And I thought everybody would be really excited about yeah. seeing this. And everybody is like, I could just say it's, oh shit. <laughs> they're, they're coming the writing us. was on the wall yep. that, you know, the, the next generation of computing was going to kill their company. Oh man. And they saw it. I mean, I didn't see it because I was excited. It was, right, right. It only a little while later I realized, oh, yeah, that was. <laughs> oh, no, that, that makes sense. They, they, uh, they were seeing the, the death of their business. Uh, but anyway, so what I had decided to do, I, want, I, I decided I wanted to do a game. Right. And I started doing it on the, uh, on the Apple. Uh, and the idea was I wanted, I, I had this idea, I'm going to build this world. And in those days, you know, doing Apple II games, uh, you kind of had two kinds. You had like the Ultima, the original Ultima games, where you had this tile thing you walk around. The other was these bitmaps. There wasn't even bitmaps. There was kind of this drawing thing, and you click on it, and you go to the next thing. And gotcha. Mist was kind of an example of that that came much later. Um, and so I tried doing that second. I, I wanted to create a world that you could actually be in. And so uh, I did this. Uh, let's see what happens when you go in a cave. And I did about 20 or 30 of these little cave things. And that's all it fit on a disc. Gotcha. I was like, this ain't going to work. <laughs> right. You know, um, but when I got the Mac, I thought, okay, maybe I can do something more interesting. The, the problem with the Mac, of course, at that time was there were no tools. Everybody had to use a Lisa, which is a bigger, more powerful computer to program the Mac. And so... All I could do was, you know, play with it and explore it. Although that was valuable too. Um, that the Mac shipped with a program called MacWrite and MacPaint, and uh, I just, I think, I still think MacWrite, not Mac, Mac, I still think MacPaint is one of the most elegant, beautiful programs ever written, and that had a huge influence on me as well. Uh, but in any case, wh what happened is uh, finally we got some good tools, uh, got us uh, C compilers that you could actually use on the Mac. Uh, I remember this incredibly long, arduous process where you, you would edit your code, then you put another disk in, you compile your code, put another disk in. Oh, wow. And, uh, and then finally you get to run it, and what would happen is it crashed. Oh, no. And you repeat. It was like a 15, 20 minutes. Oh, wow. Every time. Uh, later on, we got uh, hard drives and, uh, Stuff and like things that like that. But, um, but I had this idea of, 
uh, doing a, a real-time 3D world. And the and actually, the reason I wound up doing that wasn't necessarily because uh, I, I like 3D. I thought it was really fascinating. But I, I really thought of it as a compression technology. Interesting. Where I could create an incredibly large 3D world uh, that took very, very little space. In other words, you're, com you're, you're trading you know, with, with the uh, Apple. You, you know, all that information had to be on the disk. And so you see a picture of a of a cavern, a cave, and then another picture, and all those things had to be uploaded and displayed, and then, but with the Mac, the Mac was actually fast enough that I could render a 3D image. Interesting. Uh, a, 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 a pr pretty fast. And, um, and I, I, I just, you know, I, I basically uh, figured out how to do uh, Real-time 3D on what's you know, uh, was a six megahertz machine that had no, it didn't wow. even have a um, floating point. Wow, it, it was uh, it was pretty limited. Uh, but but I, um, uh, I I I started building this game and it was really interesting. The first time I got the 3D image, it took about oh, I don't know 10 seconds to render it. But I didn't care. I realized as soon as I could get to ten seconds, I knew I could get it down. Right, to you made it. it. Was, and um, and then I, you know, the, then you just then that's just optimizations, and um, and so the, f the other thing I realized is that the world I wanted to build was too big, to be able to just um, uh, you know kind of do it. I, I started doing graph paper. And I was like, this is crazy. <laughs> and, and so I wrote a program to build the world. Oh wow! A, a little map maker, I called it. And that, uh, that was huge uh, because all of a sudden then I could build the whole world out. And, and then now it was so funny because I remember the first time I actually had, uh, I could move through the corridors. You know, they had these, uh, Colony was the game that, right. and this is before it even had a name. Uh, I could see the, this corridor and think of it sort of like, um, uh, you know, the sort of cubic spaces you're looking at you're in a cube and then there's you're looking at the next cube and it's this you're inside this corridor of the, the lines and uh and I, I could see down and I, and I had this corner down at the end and i knew by the way i knew that if i turned the corner the system would crash i mean i, I understood <laughs> but it, i couldn't not do that right i had to go down to the end of that the corridor, the corridor. and turn right and crash but it was just like and I, I didn't know. Maybe it would have survived. I've seen something magical there. Right, right, right. Uh, but, but it was just like, and I realized this is just so compelling. Right. That, that even though I knew it was going to die, I, I had no choice but to try it. And so, um, and so I built out uh, I, I, the game engine. And I built out the tools. And then I went to uh, Boston Macworld and tried to sell the idea. Gotcha. So I met with a number of game companies, showed them what we were doing. They yeah. were all like, oh, this is amazing. Uh, I wound up showing it to um, Scott Burfield, who was at a company called Mindscape. doesn't exist anymore. Um, and he was just blown away. And so he, he said, I, got, I have to have you talk to our VP. And I, um, so I was like, great, great. I was excited. Yeah. He's excited. So I go in to, to see her, and I'm showing, yeah, this is at the show, it's on the floor, and I'm right. showing this game in, in a Mac. And she, she looks at it, it's like, great, but do you have a game? And I said, well, you can make any kind of game with this. <laughs> right, right. So I, I, you know, I tried to explain to her yeah. that you know, it, was, uh, it was a game engine, and the idea was, you know, and she said, no, I, I, I can't invest in that. I need a game. And I was like, holy crap. I, and which, <laughs> basically, I... I, I uh, I, so I, I went away and it's like, oh, what am I do? Yeah. And I, um, uh, I started working on a game. Nice. And um, so it was literally a year later I went back to, because it took a while. To right, do it took games. some time. And I showed them uh, Colony uh, Very cool. for the first time. And uh, they were you know, blown away. Yeah. Uh, and it, um, uh, uh, it, yeah, I, I wound up w working with Scott and uh, another guy, Peter Sills, there who um, were, were great uh, product managers uh, and uh, producers, really. And uh, Colony came out 
1987, 88, uh, it was um, the very first real-time 3D shooter um, uh, adventure game. Right, because cool. so that's why it's notable. It's the first kind of, yep. you know, we think of first-person shooters today, incredibly popular, but that was the, kind of the first one yeah. that you could buy. Yeah, it really, it really was. Uh, I mean, there were some things that kind of, I mean, obviously there were adventure games, but right. they weren't like that. They were shooters. They weren't like what we did. This thing was like the really, the, the real deal. And um, it won Best Adventure Game of the Year from Mac, Macworld, I think. Um, and uh, it, it really showed what was possible. I, actually, I, I know that the guys who uh, created uh, John Carmack at, at Ed saw it. So it, it kind of proved that that kind of thing was possible. Gotcha. Which was r- really kind of one of the, maybe the most important part of what it did. Wasn't right. Because it? Colony itself, first of all, was only on the Mac for a while. We got it to the PC and to the Amiga, but by that point, Mindscape was uh, kind of going down the, gotcha. down the tube, so they didn't put any marketing behind it, which is a shame. But but uh, a couple of things happened. Uh, one was uh, a guy named Mike Backus somehow got a pirated copy, <laughs> and he showed it to Jim Cameron, uh, the movie director. Avatar and Titanic. Yeah. And... He, uh, Jim was working on a movie, The Abyss. Ah, The, the Abyss. It's a great movie. And, and um, so Bacchus asked me to uh, do basically a real-time set visualization because they had this huge underwater set that they were building. Right. And they needed to see what, what's it look like? How can we explore that? So what I did was I took the, that engine, that, I mean, that, that game design thing, and I built out the world that they gave me. Oh, wow. It was actually, um, Ron Cobb had designed this amazing place. Ron, Ron by the way, was the guy who designed uh, the spaceship in Alien. He designed oh, really? uh, stuff for Conan the Barbarian. He, he was ju- he's just one of the, one of the most amazing uh, designers. Uh, uh, he, I don't know if you've ever heard of the, the ecology symbol, but he, he designed that, too. Oh, wow. Um, he just passed away uh, a couple months ago, actually, which is oh, man. which is sad. That's a shame. But he sent me these blueprints of this amazing underwater, the uh, uh, deep core drilling platform, and and so I laid that out and and I sent him a disc, and they used it to see what the set was going to look like before they built it. And they actually realized the whole section of the set would never show up on film, so they didn't have oh, wow. to build it. That saved him a couple million dollars. Nice. They never paid me though. But oh man, that's okay. <laughs> I, I actually, I'm the very last credit in that. Really, movie. really. You watch it. Go all the way to the end. But, you'll see my name. That's, that's awesome. That's about, it was, it was about an inch tall, even on a big even movie the, theater. It, it, was, it was, still cool. That's really um, cool. And so, and the other thing that happened was uh, Tom Clancy uh, had read about my game at one, with one of the Mac uh, fan magazines, and got a hold of it. And so he uh, got in touch with my publisher. Interesting. And at the time, I was reading his book, Clear and Present Danger, and he was playing my game. And so oh, wow. we, we started talking. He'd call me twice a week or so, yeah. and never to ask for hints. He never asked for hints. All he did was yell at me. Because he was like, <laughs> I can't believe you, son of a bitch, did this and that. And like, so, um, so that was um, – so Colony was um, – Kind of the, the right stepping stone. And I realized this, you know, after what I did with Cameron, uh, I realized this idea of tools are really uh, possible. You can actually right. create a, a tool that lets you create 3D space. That, gotcha. That, and not just, you know, static, but, you know, where you can move through it. And so I did a prototype. Oh, I, I forgot. I left out a whole section. Um, I, I wound up getting married in Boston. Uh to Eric's mother, uh, and, and uh, we we um, uh, we had our first first son, which is Eric's older brother, a- Asher, and um, uh, we decided we couldn't afford to live in Boston. You know? Yeah, and so I wound up looking for a job. I wound up getting a position at Lord Corporation. Uh, it's in, in Cary, uh, in the robotics group. Oh wow! And uh, yeah, you know, so basically doing research in industrial automation. And so I spent uh, quite a few years doing robotics while I was doing the game at the same time. That's it cool. It was awesome. And the other thing I was doing was uh, I was using the Mac, the 3D stuff I had developed, to um, 
uh, basically uh, visualize the robotics, uh, the, the robot's uh, perspective on what's going on in, in its world. It was, a, it was a, a big robot arm that we were controlling and we were using tactile sensing and gotcha. force torque sensing. So we could use that to kind of probe a table and find what's on it and, and, and manipulate it. And so I built this 3D uh, robot arm there. And uh, actually I made that available to uh, open source at some point. But for a while, it was literally everything that was on the Mac that was 3D was mine. There oh, was like wow. nothing else for that mine stuff. Yeah. Anyway, so I, I realized with all that, I did a prototype of a 3D uh, design tool that was next step beyond the, the map making thing I did for Colony. And, uh, and that became a product called Virtus Walkthrough, which is the first real time 3D design tool for, for PCs. Uh, that shipped um, nine, uh, November 1990 and won the first breakthrough product of the year from uh, uh, Mac User Magazine. And that, wow. that, was, that was pretty awesome. That was just launched us into the stratosphere. And, um, and, and actually, what, going back to Tom, Tom asked me what I was doing next after he finished playing the game. Yeah. He was just like stoked about that. It was like new technology. It was very cool. He loved the Mac. And so I said I was doing, you know, starting this new company, Virtus, and he became my first outside investor and our first outside board member. Oh, wow. That, so, so Walkthrough launched, uh, we did pretty well with it. Not amazingly. I think we set too high a price for it, but that's a different story. Uh, but Tom and I wanted to do games together. Interesting. And so we started uh, on some ideas. Uh, we actually created a game called SSN, uh, and this is sort of showed, showed me the power of branding because um, uh, they took the game design for SSN that was um, th that, that the team had created. Juan Benito was the, the game designer for that. They took that game design and turned it into a paperback book called SSN, same as the, as the game. Yeah. And... Uh, it, the book was terrible, but it became a number one New York Times bestseller. No way. And I was like, oh, shoot. Interesting. So branding, you know, it's like you got Tom Clancy's logo on there. You right. can sell anything. And, and, uh, but SSN did pretty well, and we decided let's do the real thing. And so that's how um, Tom, uh, we had brought in um, Doug Littlejohns uh, as an advisor for SSN, who is a good friend of Tom's, and... Uh, so basically we hired him as a CEO of a new game company called Red Storm Entertainment. Interesting. And uh, they, uh, we had three ideas, three game ideas. Um, one of them was a game called Rainbow Six. Wow. And um, my, uh, the, the, one of the engineers w working for me, the one, one of the, the, the lead engineer on SSN, wound up becoming the game designer for that as Brian Upton. And uh, that the other games they did were interesting, but that one just hit it out of the park. It was a completely new rethinking about what a shooter was. It was, uh, and so that one uh, just absolutely took off. And I knew, I mean, it was just like, we could see the curve. Unfortunately, Tom got kind of frustrated uh, with, um, with the SSN thing, there was some infighting. You know, Doug and I don't like each other much, um, <laughs> and um, and so we wound up selling that company to Ubisoft, which is you know they, they they've taken it in incredible places. Yeah. But I just knew that game was going to take off. In fact, the, the year after we sold it, it did 125 million in revenue. Oh it was my. just like so. It was painful. Um, Brian then did uh, Ghost Recon, which is another big right. big game. Um, and uh, so the rest of that was, you know, once it was in Ubisoft, it was sort of history. But uh, that, that all started from me telling Tom we need to start a game company, which uh, worked out uh, extraordinarily well. I mean, Tom, it worked out really well for Tom. Right. Uh, I, I'd say, you know, for Virtus and me, it was oh, so so. We made some, but not, it wasn't right. a big deal. Uh, but uh, on their side, it really transformed. Uh, you know the the landscape for gaming. It changed the way you think about what what's possible uh, with with, uh, 
with you know action games. Um, I the the odd thing was uh, right about that time, Michael Crichton got in touch with me. Uh, you know the guy who created Jurassic yeah. Park and and Drama Strain. He created ER, and um, he he had this idea uh, for a book, and he wanted he wanted to explore the idea of building a game off of it. And I thought this could be interesting. I tried to get them together, uh, Clancy and Crichton, but they didn't like each other. Really, <laughs> uh, sad. Uh, but so I wound up becoming the CEO of Michael Crichton's game company. And that was fascinating. It was a two year, it was a painful experience in a really? lot of ways. Well, Michael is a genius. I mean, no question, but he, um, you know, it's one of those things he writes bestsellers, his movies are, are, are huge blockbusters. He created, uh, the ER, uh, uh, TV show. TV show and wrote the first, basically the entire first season. And so almost everything he touched worked out. Uh, and we figured, well, he must know what he's doing. Right. So we'll let him do the game design because that's what he wanted to do. And of course, every other media that he had worked in, he controlled everything. I when see. You, when you're writing a book, you know, you, you're, you're basically on a rail, or the, the, right. the reader's on a rail wherever the... the wherever you take them. And same thing is true of a movie, same thing is true. Uh, games are very different. In games, you have to cede control to the... Um, uh, the user to can the user. do what they want let to do to a certain extent. Do it. Exactly. And he had difficulty doing that. You know? And so we wound up creating a game that honestly was not fun at all because, <laughs> oh, no. well, yeah, it, it's just too much control. I or see. It gave you hints that were, you know, like, well, didn't give you not. Uh, the, the, the magic of gaming is failure is part of it, right? Uh, you don't think of it that way, but the, the key idea is failure is important as long as you learn a little bit from the failure. Gotcha. And, but if there's no failure or if the system helps you too much, then there's no game. Right, well, Gaming, right, right. You know, it's like there's you no challenge. To, just kind you of have to have this, you know, yin yang part. Right, and so timeline was you know, was quite pretty, uh, and we built a pretty neat game engine for it. But at the end of the day, it, the game kind of sucked, uh, which was a shame. Uh, I felt like, um, you know, it's one of those things I realized I should have fired. Michael, but, uh, <laughs> but I, how can you do I, that? I, right. I you know, that. Like, yeah, but, exactly. But, that was, but anyway, uh, actually going back in time a little bit. So, so what verse walkthrough came out 1990 and we started working with Apple right around then. And, um, one of the people helping us to market it was, uh, Bonnie McBird. You probably don't know who she is, but she is, uh, one, there's two really interesting things about her. One is, there's actually more than that, but <laughs> two. In particular. She she wrote the movie Tron. Oh wow! And uh, and she's also was married to Alan Kay. Ah. Alan is uh, very likely one, if not the most, so certainly one of the most important computer scientists uh, since computer science started, which right. really isn't that long ago. But uh, Alan was the guy who. Um, understood that computers were a medium. Uh, he had this concept he called the Dynabook, which was what we think of as tablets today or laptops. That He, he had that, I, that vision in 1968. Man. And then uh, he also was the one who invented what we call object-oriented programming today. Uh, of course, what people refer to object-oriented programming today isn't quite what he meant, but you know, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's still kind of the same vat of ideas. So Alan was uh, a senior fellow at, at Apple at, at that point. And Bonnie, you know, who's working with us, said, I have to show this to Alan or you need to talk to Alan. So I wound up going to visit with Alan uh, in 90, 91, something like that. And I showed him uh, Virus Walkthrough. And he said, well, people told me this was the best program on the Mac, and they, and he said, and I can see that it really is, <laughs> and that was just awesome. To have, I mean, he it's was a good feeling. he was a hero of of mine, uh, because yeah, it's like this idea of computing 
isn't just number crunching. It really is a, a, a different kind of animal. And of course, his work was what influenced uh, the creation of the Macintosh. Steve Jobs um, visited Xerox Park uh, in, I think, 78 to, and got the first demos uh, uh, of the Xerox Alto. It was actually Dan Ingalls, who was the one who, who uh, actually created Smalltalk, uh, who did that demo, and who's also a good friend of mine now. But, uh, uh, but the Macintosh was a, uh, it was a direct descendant of the Xerox Alto, which is the first real human-centered computer. It was actually designed around this idea of uh, enabling children oh, wow. to, to uh, think, to work. And, and so, of course, I, I knew a lot of this, not all of it, but um, so, uh, so Alan and I started talking about what's next. And, and this is uh, before we started Red Storm, before we did uh, uh, Timeline. And it was two things that were pretty clear. Uh, one uh, was 3D was going to be a dominant part of computing, which is particular interest of mine. And the other was collaboration. Now, collaboration we think of today as like, well, you're doing Zoom calls and stuff. Right. But if you go back to the original ideas of what computers were for uh, and, and how they were imagined, this is a, you know the the early days of. Uh, what was called then ARPA, which is became DARPA, but DARPA is not ARPA. Ar ARPA was really thinking big, big ideas. And one of the ideas was this idea of an intergalactic network. And, the internet. Uh, that became the internet. And, uh, and, and Doug Engelbart uh, was one of the primary visionaries of what all that meant. In particular, looking at the computer as a symbiotic system that enables you to communicate with other people and share ideas and create together. And, and so that was um, at, at, at SRI. Um, and, and Doug started this program. Actually, it's so magic. I, I, I know no, no one will do this. But he wrote a, a paper. A, it's almost a book in 1962 uh, called Augmenting Human Intellect that set the, the uh, really set the, the whole idea of what computing would be. Uh, it, he, that was the start, where he described computers being used to uh, communicate, uh, to, to think, to design. Uh, he even talked about architectural worlds where you create a, a building and walk through it, all that. Everything that we think of today. Remember, this is 1962. Man. So he had a team at SRI, and they created um, a, a system called NLS, online system, uh, that uh, demonstrated that. And in 1968, he uh, set up this demo at uh, one of the big computer conferences uh, where uh, they had a microwave link between uh, Menlo Park, which is where SRI was located, and downtown San Francisco. And they did uh, a demo that blew people away. It was the first time people had seen Windows, first time people had seen hypertext, first time people had seen a mouse. Man. All that was being shown for the first time. You can actually watch this. Uh, it's called the mother of all demos. It's referred to that now. Um, and um, it just completely changed everything for everybody. Um, and, uh, and what's really magical is you watch it today, and it's like, there's stuff in there we still haven't done. Interesting. Um, now, the way he did it was everybody was on the same computer. That, was, that made the collaboration part a lot easier. Going back to the stuff I did at Thermo Electron, everybody was on the same computer there, too. I mean, we, we didn't have to just, like, figure out how to send bits from one computer to another. They were all the same location. So all I had to do was open a file and, I see. or access it. So... But uh, with, um, with Doug's system, it's the same thing. Everybody was on the same computer, but they have their own screens. And, but they share those screens. So you could see my mouse on your screen, and I could wow. see the mouse on mine. It was all live. 
and including, by the way, even video chat, video conferencing. Really? You know, they they they, had, they showed that in 1968, and that just blows your mind. Where you right. have, you're sharing a video, you're sharing a mouse. The things that I'm doing today, yeah. uh, we're already there, and, and that was. Um, uh, and Alan was part of that. I mean, he, he knew those people very well. He was, he, he was getting his PhD from University uh, of Utah, and um, and part of his PhD work was visiting all the labs. And he spent a lot of time with Engelbart and seeing what they were doing, and that had huge influence on him, uh, along with Seymour Papert and those. But a- anyway, uh, so what was really interesting is when Alan and I started uh, talking in around ninety. Uh, that idea was already there, but hadn't been implemented. And the reason uh, it, it, that that idea that Engelbart had with collaboration got lost uh, at Park, and and for one very very good reason, which was the personal computer was very hard to do collaboration on. Now, why they is that? Had, they, well, they had invented the Ethernet there. Which, and a lot of the, what turned into the internet was, was also developed at Xerox Park. Uh, but the problem was, when you're doing collaboration and everybody's on the same computer, it's very easy to share that screen. That makes sense. But when you're, everybody's on a different system, how do you get that same, I'm there? You know, you and I right. are sharing that same space. Now, they had email. They had, you know, they could send files to each other. They had all that. But they didn't have... Uh, the collaboration side the way that Doug had it uh, and made more complex by the fact that actually it inherited Doug's team. They left SRI and came over to Xerox Park and they started a new project that they call Polos but when the Alto shows up um, the Alto was so compelling I mean it's the first real powerful personal computer right and interestingly enough, if you wanted one, you had to go down to the basement of Xerox Park and build your own. <laughs> you had to solder it together. It had all the parts down oh, there. That's great. And everybody did. And that just sucked up all the energy of Xerox Park. It was so compelling. It was so powerful. And so the Polos uh, computer and that room just got basically abandoned. Wow. And, and so the na- that, that, that next generation version of, of collaboration got, uh, uh, got lost. So in a way, you know, the, the vision of Allen, which w- w- was this uh, Xerox Alto, which was they referred to as the interim Dyna book that Allen had in, you know, invented this idea of uh, a tablet, um, had, c- had killed uh, collaboration. And so we were, Allen and I were like, how do we get it back? And so, um, in 1994, I did the first iteration of what became Croquet, which is what we have today. Uh, it was called ICE, Interactive Collaboration Environment. In fact, if you look on YouTube, David A. Smith 3D, all one word, uh, look, uh, I have a bunch of videos there, and one of them is ICE, I-C-E. And uh, it was the first real-time 3D interactive space. Multiple people had this... Uh, I had these kind of flying helicopters, which were TVs. And you could actually <laughs> see the video of the other people. Uh, oh, that's and you cool. Could, like, they'd fly around and yeah. you could interact. And you could share like uh, 3D paint programs or whatever. I'll, I'll, there's a bunch of apps I built to, uh, to demonstrate this. And it was all object-based. It was really quite quite compelling. It's actually, uh, even today, we're not quite to what that was. Right. Uh, but it was, um, it, was, it was pretty wonderful. Um, and so I, I was definitely interested in this, these ideas. Uh, the, the landscape wasn't quite ready for that, perhaps. But what happened was uh, when uh, the, the project with Michael Crichton died, I got in touch with Alan and I said, hey, look, I, I, I need something to do. I, I, let, can, I, can I join your group? And I'll just yeah. sweep the floors or something. You know, I figured out, I just want to be part of that. Right. And Alan said, let's just do that idea you had. Nice. And so in the year 2000, we started building the first version of Croquet. Alan brought in uh, David Reed. David, uh, uh, among other things, invented an internet protocol called UDP, 
which you may have heard of. It's a lot of games use that for communication. And he was also known as the slash and TCP IP. Oh, wow. Uh, he's the guy who figured out TCP could be on top of IP, internet, you know, internet protocol. Um, and uh, his thesis is actually on replicated uh, uh, computation which proved to be the secret sauce of what we needed to do. And uh, another person that was involved was a guy that had been working with Alan, Andreas Robb, who proved to be, I mean, just the most amazing programmer I ever worked with. He, 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 wound, up, he wound up becoming my best friend and we just, uh, we worked together for 10 years. And it was, it, it was pretty marvelous. Uh, but we started the Croquet Project and we built uh, uh, a system called Open Croquet uh, that had the, you know that that took the ideas I had done in '94 and took them and made them real. Uh, everything in there was full object oriented. It was ba actually built on top of Squeak, which is a variation of, of Smalltalk, and uh, you could interact with everything. Everything was shared. Everything, uh, and um, so it, it, it was it was a marvelous system. Um, it, yeah, it really showed what was what was possible in a way that you know hadn't been no one had seen before, and, and still hasn't really be done, been done again. I, I started working on that, but I, 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 oddly enough, the stuff I'm doing today is the foundation of what's going to be that, but it's not it's not that yet. We're we're doing it a little bit slower this time, but uh, uh, but while we, we wound up solving a very, very hard problem, which is how do you do this idea of replicated computation that David Reed had uh, proved to be the center of, of the thing. And it turned out that was really, really hard. Um, uh, the, the, his original concept was uh, basically kind of using a majority rules model See, see, one of the problems is, is when I interact, both of us are looking at the same thing. Right. I interact with that, and that means I send a message to you, and right. uh, it changes your world and vice versa. You, but what happens if they cross? What happens, you know, there, there's this weird thing where they can get out of sync, and right. it's very easy to get out of sync, and how do you avoid that? David's original concept was using what uh, he called a two-phase commit, uh, which is basically sort of a majority of rules. Everybody agrees that I happened. See. But then the problem is what happens if they don't agree that it happened, then you have this problem that we call rollback, which means that that never happened. You have to pretend it never happened. And rollbacks are, are, are very hard because it's a lossy kind of c compute. I won't get into more detail. And, that, the, and this, this is kind of like the problem. So for looping it back for our listeners, in Google Docs, how... How do you manage when you have different users using some yeah. document at the same time? That's true. And Google Docs uses uh, uh, a, a thing called CRDTs or operational transforms. I forget which. They're very similar. But with what they're doing is that's kind of a, a database transaction where uh, what you need to have is that it be identical over a period of time. It speed, is, speed is an essential. Um, and in fact, the, the other thing is uh, it's using a, a mathematical formalism that's called associativity where A followed by B is the same as B followed by A. Interesting. Okay, so, but, but again, the, 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 there was no need for it to be real time. We needed real time. We needed to be able to have an interaction occur within milliseconds. Of, of, you know, and so, uh, like, if I pick up a, a ball and throw it to you, and you see that ball coming, I see that ball being thrown, you need to be able to put your hand up and catch it. Right. Well, that's you've got milliseconds to do all that, and uh, operational transforms aren't going to be able to do that. You, you know, got it's it. basically, uh, yeah, that the ball's going to be well behind you before you even right. know that it's been launched. Um, so, so what we wanted, and what we, 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 we is essential, really, is that that kind of instant interaction when I'm doing something you're doing something has to be instantaneous but it also has to be perfectly replicated and that's where we go to this replicated computation model that Croquet used where imagine you and I are running a computer it's a you know this black box but that black box if we open the hood of both of them they're exactly the same state okay 
That means, and you close it, and you run it, and you open it again, it's exactly the same state, all right? As long as you're not doing anything to it, Got uh, it. This should be always that same state going through time. It might be different states over time, but it's always going to be, mine is going to be the same as yours. Makes sense. It's like we set up dominoes exactly the same, and we push those dominoes, and those dominoes keep going and going and going, and they're going to fall in exactly the same way for, for both those sets of dominoes if they're set up perfectly. I see. But that's hard, but computing can do it. Well, that, that's part one. So you assume this replicate computation model the second part is how do I guarantee that when I interact with something that that interaction to my set of dominoes is going to be exactly the same as your set uh, of dominoes. And that was where the magic happened. This is thing it. Andreas, Rob, and I figured out a way to ensure that those, the dominoes that I have and the dominoes you have, this like, I, let's just say I, I want to move one of them or do something to it that changes the behavior but it has to be done for all the participants who have their own sets of dominoes. So how do you do that? And we realized um, that, the, the, that the only way to really pull it off was to virtualize time, which meant when I do something, uh, I don't say what time it happens. Instead, I send it to what we call a reflector. It's a kind of server. Server puts a timestamp, what time it thinks, and distributes to everybody. So all these, you know, virtual computers with our, their dominoes inside right. them get an event at exactly the same virtual time. That uh. means that all of those events occur simultaneously, virtually simultaneously. And so all the dominoes that are being affected are affected at the same virtual time, and that's how it works. Got it. That was the, the real magic uh, of the system. There's way more to it than that. So, for example, a new user joins, well, you have to figure out a way to get them all the dominoes, <laughs> you know, make a copy of all the dominoes right. that you have right now and, and, uh, and then do that. But anyway, we, we figured it out. Uh, and uh, then we started a company based on that called uh, Teleplace. And, uh, and it was a real-time 3D environment for enterprise. It's used mostly for training. It's still around. It's called Turf now, T-U-R-F. And, uh, and, and, and basically it works just like that. You do the shared replicated computation and, and everybody who's in that sees exactly what everybody else sees from different possession, right? You know, I, it, it, it's a 3D world, so you and I might be looking at each other and the dominoes are sitting between us and I push the dominoes forward and you see them all fall. So that it, it, it's the, the important thing is the compute computation of the dominoes is exactly the same. It doesn't matter if I'm looking at it from one side or the other. Uh, so we did that. And then um, I, didn't, I didn't really get along with our CEO of that company. <laughs> so I wind, wound up, uh, uh, Richard Boyd, who you know, yeah. uh, had sold a previous company to Lockheed Martin, a company I also started. Uh, nice. And uh, we, uh, uh, Lockheed bought them. And uh, I, I chose not to go because I, I, I was working on you know, the Teleplace project yeah. this other company. Uh, but I was kind of, you know, ready for a change, right. and they wanted me. So uh, after some back and forth, I wound up getting hired at Lockheed Martin. I became a senior fellow within the first year, and I was chief innovation officer. And basically, I ran all their augmented reality and virtual reality work. And then we had an opportunity. The Pentagon had a project where they wanted to do uh, what they called the virtual world framework. And I knew exactly what that was. Uh, they didn't want to work with Lockheed because they, they wanted a small company that could you know, move quickly. Right. But since our, our, our proposal was the only one that actually made any sense, <laughs> That's important. Uh, they wound up doing that. So we built the virtual framework for, uh, for the Pentagon for Frank Giovanni, who was uh, uh, director of strategy for uh, training and readiness, um, which was huge. And that, he was just like exactly the kind of funder you want who wanted something different wanted something powerful right. and so um i spent um i spent five years at lockheed building out that system and then um uh i, I actually did a number of things there one was i i invented these lenses uh for vr and, and ar that I, I are probably still the best lenses in the world for for that super wide field of view. We could do a 180 degree field of view. It was just super clear, 
And um, I was trying to get Lockheed to take it to market, but they, they yeah. just, that wasn't their business model at all. So I wound up um, uh, leaving Lockheed and trying to start a company around the, these lenses. Um, that unfortunately failed. A lot of it was because the VR world, the VR business never really took off. It's right. still now just beginning to take off, but it, it, even today it's probably still a few years away. Um, so I want that I wound up shutting that company down, which was a shame. Uh, but then Alan came back and said, "Hey, let, why don't you do that thing you've been doing?" Right. And so I uh, took another shot at it, and this time I inherited Alan's team. Uh, they were actually uh, a lot of them were at uh, Y Combinator Research Labs. Oh, cool! Uh, and uh, which, if you know Y Combinator, yeah. they 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 do um, uh, this uh, incredible program of startups uh yeah they, they do two or three of these a year i guess uh and it, it's really amazing but they had a they had a fund that was for um doing research and cool. uh, two things one was open ai which was uh what sam altman, sam altman just ran um, there. wound up leading and the other was uh human computer interface and i i inherited a lot of that team and so we went and tried. We decided to build the next version of Croquet, and that's what we did. That's what I'm doing now. Uh, started Croquet Corporation, and uh, I have one of the best teams on the planet. They're language designers, operating operating system designers, and uh, and we we're building a new platform uh, that is really next generation collaboration. You've had a chance to play with it. It's awesome. And uh, you know the goal is. Uh, that's sort of a Trojan horse in a sense. What we want to be able to do is get people to start using uh, a new way of thinking, a new way of interacting with people that's much richer than what things are out there uh, that are out there now. But it's also infinitely extensible. You, know, you can create new applications that haven't existed before and drop them into this collaboration platform. I, think, I guess the way I think about it is think of it as Zoom plus any application you can imagine that's all multi-user, collaborative, shared. Uh, new users can join instantly. It's persistent, so if you leave and come back, it's still there. Uh, most web pages already work. Soon every web page will work inside this. So basically you collate all this information in a space and you can access it any time. Um, and uh, but what's really gonna be cool in a few years, we're going to turn it inside out. It'll be an augmented reality platform. So you'll be walking oh, wow. down the street, and you'll have a full collaboration framework. Wow. And this is really one of my pet ideas, is that uh, augmented reality is primarily a communication platform. Interesting. You and I are talking, engaging, and the computer is a full uh, participant in that conversation. As we talk, it generates simulations as part of that conversation, and both of us can interact with it as if it's live, as if it's physical. Uh. Now, this is why that real-time interaction really matters, because the, the, the physical and the digital are going to merge. Interesting. And, and any interaction you imagine doing, I'm picking up this water glass and swirling it around, that could be physical and, and, and will be. I mean, it will be virtual. It could be virtual and will be. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's physical or virtual. It's all going to mix together right. seamlessly. And that means that uh, if you see me pick up this glass, but if it was virtual, you should see me pick it up in just the same way, move it, and, and you see it instantly. If I throw it at you, I won't do that. Right. But, <laughs> but if I throw it at you, you would see that happen instantly as, as part of the conversation. Uh. And this is, by the way, one of the reasons we're, we're working really closely with... Uh, uh, the telco operators is because they built out, they're building out a new generation of uh, a system called 5G. Right. And the magic of 5G is uh, bringing the latency down from, it, you know, on your regular phone, like your 4G phone, it typically has about uh, 60 to 80 additional milliseconds on top of whatever you do. Um, we're at, 5G is going to get down to 5 to 10 to 15 wow. milliseconds. That's way below what humans can see. And when you couple that with something like, you know, croquet, where you get that super fast collaboration, right. that means that physical interaction I was just describing becomes real. Wow. And that's what's about to happen. And that's our goal is ultimately using these technologies to enable you to collaborate 
uh, engage with other people for fun, for you know, uh, for enterprise interactions. For it doesn't matter. It's all going to be, uh, it's all going to be live. It's all going to be real. And the distinction between the physical and the virtual is just going to dissolve completely, because they're both per perfectly registered. They're both live. They're both Got you know, it. instantaneous. And that's that's where um, that's where we're going. That's what our mission is. Ultimately, in the short term, we're building a, an incredibly powerful collaboration platform that's open, extensible, uh, really changes the way you can engage. I mean, it, it, you know, you, you, if you're using a, 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 a collaboration tool today, imagine that everything works that way, which is what we're That'd doing. That'd be great. Um, at where there is no limit to what you're, you're able to engage with and how you're able to share. Right. Uh, and that's that's what Croquet, um, we have a product called Croquet Q that is doing that. So Croquet Q's roadmap is, you know, today we've got video, we've got all these applications. Uh, uh, Google Docs works in there, for example. Uh, but the next generation is going to be a totally wearable system where you are interacting uh with another person uh, as, as if it's as if it's live as if it's real because it will be that's amazing and i actually i used croquet two hours on for two hours on friday with eric and we we did an entire project in croquet and it was it was seamless and it was so much okay. easier than trying to you know use zoom and then switch over and tell each other which doc we were in and eat what time i mean it was a seamless experience it's yeah, pretty it's amazing get better uh the, the, the version we're shipping a, a version of it hopefully in next week or two that uh makes it even better so it, it, it's um we're very we're really, like, really excited about that but uh that that's been kind of the story from there to here and the, and the mission is really i call it the augmented conversation you know, you and I wow. talking and, um, and our ability to explore ideas together that aren't possible right. otherwise. I mean, and, and, and it's like I want to be able to explore these really complicated and powerful ideas as easily as we talk about the weather. And that's where we're going. That's what we're after. And it's going to be um, – it's absolutely going to happen. I mean, we know how to do it. There's, we don't see any technical barriers anymore. Uh, we expect that augmented reality is going to be pretty good in the next few years, and it's going to be amazing in the next ten years. Right. Uh, and then it's going to become invisible. You know, wow. you, you, people put you put your glasses on in the morning, right? Yeah. Where you're augmenting your vision. Right. right. <laughs> literally, quite literally. But uh, what's going to happen is you're going to put on a pair of glasses that uh, basically colors the world any way you want to. Uh, that it becomes an information space that's always on, always available, uh, or it could be just wallpaper, right? You know, you can you decide you like, uh, you don't, you're not a fan of green, make everything purple, or you want your best friend to be Humphrey Bogart. Not only will he look <laughs> that way, but he'll sound that way, and you know, you, he won't know that you're, you've transformed him. It doesn't matter, but you know, that, that that's by the way, that's a business that people are already looking at, where they're going to be licensing. Uh, famous personalities from the past <laughs> in that just that way, so you actually pay a, a fee to uh, the you know to to some group someday to be able to utilize that persona. That's amazing. So do you think? Uh, so you've had this vision for a while. Do you think it's been mainly? You know, there's hardware challenges, there's latency challenges that have prevented it from coming to life until now. Do you, do you think there's are there adoption challenges? You know, we had Google Glass. Yeah. Early, you know, a couple of years ago, and there's some real adoption challenges. It, it's, there's a lot that has to converge um, to get AR really good. Right. I mean, VR too, but there, they, and um, so much of it is, um, you know, well, I, the, 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 there have been some key elements that made it possible. One was. The, the rise of the smartphone. A friend of mine uh, is uh, Mark Bolas. Uh, Mark was a professor at uh, USC uh, who, who, who ran the uh, MXR lab, the, the, the VR, AR re research lab. That's where Palmer Lucky was working. Oh, yeah. Uh, Palmer actually took one of Mark's ideas and used that to start Oculus. Uh, but 
but Mark had that deep insight that realized that phones have everything you need to be able to create a pretty good VR device. Uh, think about what happened with the phones is we had this incredible push for miniaturization and high resolution displays. Right. And so Mark had this idea, well, I take some lenses and put them up on there and then all of a sudden I've got this incredibly good uh, VR device. And so in a sense, the phone is what tr really kickstarted our ability to explore this space today. And uh, because there's no way to do it before, uh, if, if you look back, Ivan Sutherland did the very first uh, reasonable head mount display system. That was 1968. Wow. Uh, they had to invent everything. They had these CRTs, uh, <laughs> and they weren't, they weren't even CRTs. They were like... Um, well, they, they were CRTs, but they, they, they did line drawing or whatever. It, it, was, um, rast it wasn't raster. Um, and then he, uh, but they had to do everything. They had to do a chip to do the multipliers and the clipping and all that. They had to design the whole do thing from soup to nuts. And of course, the most they could do were cubes and things like that. It wasn't very sophisticated, but proved that, hey, there's something something there. And it's actually an augmented reality device, too. It wasn't a, not just a VR. Wow. Um, but... Going beyond that, I remember uh, at UNC Chapel Hill, which had one of the best VR labs on the planet, they had these uh, super uh, resolution micro displays. I think they were Thompson. And they're like, they came out like a, uh, half a foot or something from where <laughs> your eyes were. And, and, uh, and yeah, they were, they were just getting good enough that you could have a pretty good experience. Uh, I remember visiting them when I was at Lord. Uh, they did this one thing. It was a kitchen, a virtual reality kitchen. And I, I remember being in, in their lab. Yeah. And I, it's like, and it said, look under, you know, you could look under the, the sink. And I remember putting my hand up to brace myself to pull myself up on the table. There's no table. Right, and right, there's right. There's no counter there. Uh, so, but that was also, you know, it was like extraordinarily complex and expensive to build those. Right. It was just sort of proving that it could yeah. be done. But it was the phones that went where it went from you know, basically complex research project to commodity. I see. And, and, and uh, that's why you can buy an Oculus. Uh, 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 Rift, like 500 bucks. That's a new one. I forget what it's called. Oh, but, yeah, yeah. But, it, it, but for 350 bucks, that is astonishingly good. Right. I mean, it includes the entire computer. Everything's in there. Uh, and uh, in fact, what's really amazing is this stuff is going to drop in price. Quality is going to continue to go, go up. Uh, and so you're going to see uh, in the next few years that VR is going to become a very, very strong contender for uh, uh, you know, a place in your world. But AR is really going to th be the thing that is transformative. And uh, you know, Google Glass was an interesting idea. Um, you know, it, it, it's, I, I think it was a necessary thing to try, uh, but, you know, it was a research project that was masquerading as fashion, which was a shame. Right. Uh, but that, that didn't matter. You know, we, yeah. people put it out there, tried it, learned a lot from it, and, and were iterating. Uh, but I think Apple's probably going to have something that's quite good. Uh, it's probably going to be the equivalent of your watch, you know, the Apple Watch, uh, where right. it's an information display system with some tracking. But over time, it will become really, really good. And of course, as soon as they do it, just like what happened with the iPhone, uh, the other players are going to say, oh, shit, we can't be let them ha own that space. Right. And so you're going to see the clones, like what happened with uh, the Android device, uh, which was a clone of the, uh, uh, of the iPhone. Uh, you're going to see that happen. And so we're going to have a lot of different kinds of platforms uh, for AR in the next uh, five to ten years. And then it's going to be just like what happened with the personal computer, uh, where it's uh, everywhere. Every, it's everywhere. And then what happened with the phones, where it's everywhere. Uh, so the, th the way you think about this AR device, it's going to replace your PC, it's going to replace wow. your phone, it's going to replace every single screen that you've ever seen. Wow. You don't need it anymore. I, I can create a screen as big as the world inside my AR device. Right. So why do I need a TV? doesn't matter anymore. You know? And in fact, think about it this way. You and I are talking. 
going back to this augmented conversation, I'm going to throw a, a screen up on that wall over there. Right. There it is. And not only is it up there, but it's a 3D space. It's a portal into that space. By the way, I invented portals. <laughs> uh, but uh, you'll actually see into that, that world. Yeah. There may be somebody on the other side looking back at us. That's cool. That's really cool. And, and magically, do you lend any credence to that? Do you think it'll work? I don't think they're the ones. I, I think that that was a lot of hype. Uh, it was very telling that the original ideas they had for the technology that they used to get the company funded proved not to work. Got it. So you have to be really careful. Uh, throwing a lot of money at these things isn't always the best idea. Interesting. Because you don't always get something that is is real. So I, I think that was a lot of hype. It was really telling that they were hiring huge number of people on the studio side versus the technical side. Interesting. Yeah, you know, I think they did quite the spend more money on that, which is a shame because <laughs> uh, maybe none of that content's ever going to show up. Right. But yeah, I, I think that was, um, in a sense, the wrong way to do it. Apple's doing it right in so many ways. They're kind of scary. Uh, I mean, obviously they're the, they're using their phone ecosystem to do the experimentation and the uh, uh, creating the awareness. The idea of using right. the phone as a kind of AR device is quite powerful. So not only are they learning about what's necessary, but so are their develop so is their development community and so are their customers. So it's the same technology. When they when they stuck the LiDAR into the iPad and now the most recent high end phones, uh, that's pretty strong. Uh, where uh, having a, a LiDAR device uh, which basically gives you a, a full three D mapping of of the surfaces in front of you. I didn't realize they put that in the phones. That's really the, interesting. The most recent announcement, yeah, that's in there. Wow. Um, is a game changer. It, it really says that I know what's going on around you in a, uh, in huge detail. So, so yeah, and, and so they're they're developing the key technologies. I'm sure they have pretty good displays. Uh, we'll see. Um, it, you know, it, it's going to be, it might be kind of like the Macintosh where it, it was, uh, when it first came out, it was a bit hobbled, uh, but it was, you know, clearly the thing. And of course, usually there's iteration on that. Remember right. the first iPhone didn't have an app store. Yeah, that's right. It, it, the Apple said, we'll do the apps and you can use the browser. And everybody complained about that, so Apple changed their model so that uh, they they basically added apps to iTunes. Interesting. Um, so you'll see that that first version will be really interesting, like the first Mac and the first iPhone. Right. And it'll be slightly wrong, but they'll be able to course correct. Uh, but the other thing that'll happen is everybody else is going to see that and say, oh, that's how you do it. And uh, I think it'll be... Um, I think people will catch up definitely pretty quickly. So there'll be a lot of options. Uh, and then, then, like I said, you're going to start seeing the death of all these other platforms. They're all going right. to start disappearing. Um, but yeah, uh, I, but that, that, that's the world that we're really excited about um, because it really is an amplification of reality that's about to occur. And I, I see the collaboration aspects as an essential part and I, I think we've got the best, uh, in a way, I think it's hard to imagine how you do it any other way than what we're doing it. Right. So, so yeah, I, I think it's a pretty exciting time to be still in this game and, and still uh, uh, being a part of the, the, uh, the next big thing. So uh, what did the next 20 years look like for you? You know, is it, is it bringing those technologies to life? Yeah, I mean, that's what I do. I mean, it's sort of, um, th this has been the big story, you know, obviously 3D and collaboration. So I've been doing this for uh, over 30 years. Um, and uh, I don't plan to stop that because, you know, once you get the frameworks built, then it's all about the applications. What do you do with this? And right. I think that's pretty interesting. But I also think there's a lot of other really hard problems I like hard problems and that's sort of um, uh, and I, I suspect there's going to be some really interesting uh, things that 
we're going to discover have to be done um, that may be related to this, maybe totally different. You know, uh, Tanjo started out with a very different idea. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and um, and I I, I I I sort of see this. That I, I think there's going to be a lot of other kinds of. Uh, we're in this extraordinary time where nothing's impossible. You know, it's we, wild. We've got. Um, you know, people don't realize just how fast computing is changing. Uh, the, obviously, you think about well, Moore's Law is hitting kind of a barrier, but that Moore's Law is irrelevant because you're looking at uh, not the CPU, but the GPU. GPU is thousands and thousands of little tiny processors right. all working in concert. That's the reason, well, obviously, we, we use that for graphics, but it's the same technology that's used for uh, the AI today right. the, you know this um, uh, you know neural net kind of model is Bayesian system um, and uh, and you know I don't think we've really thought through all the other kinds of applications for that kind of scalability you know these things are just remarkably fast and powerful and interesting and they're off the curve you know right. what we're seeing uh, what we're seeing with AI today is going to be totally transformative in a way that I think is going to be very hard for us to understand or predict. I don't think necessarily it's going to turn into what we think, you know, AI, artificial intelligence. I don't know that it'll be intelligent for a while. It might that act sense. that way. It may act that way, but I don't think it's really going to be that way for a while because the brain's a very sophisticated thing. It's got a lot of interacting parts and i don't think we're it's going to take us a while to understand that it doesn't mean we can't get to that but it's going to right. be, be a while uh but on their side there's what can we do with that um some pretty impressive things uh um that uh, uh that obviously if we, we can't quite imagine the other thing that's happening is biology we're getting some very very deep insights and it's really kind of this fusion of using uh ai plus biology to explore uh, you know kind of gene modification for example uh, you're, right. you're going to start seeing some really powerful uh, hybrid technologies uh, there um, yeah we're, we're, we're just at we're, we're so I've got weird, one more question for you it's a kind what, of what's kind of the biggest lesson right. to take away from your career so far and you still got a long ways to go so yeah uh, I guess um, I think that um, uh, it, it, at least I, I, it's a simple thing actually if you have an ability to make a difference and the opportunity to do it and you really have an obligation to act that's a really good everything point everything I've ever done I've sort of felt I, I can do this uh, and so I have to do it you know I always think of it as the world's going to be a better place if I act, I don't, no one will probably know who I am 20, 30 years from now, but I did a lot of stuff that people use today and don't even think about, you right. know, and, and that's pretty cool. And I think uh, everybody has that opportunity. Everybody has that ability. And I think everybody has that obligation to, right. uh, to act. That's great. You have some responsibility there. So, uh, David, where can we find Croquet and, and your work and, and where would you like to direct people to? Yeah, um, the company is at croquet.io, uh, C-R-O-Q-U-E-T dot I-O. Although there's nothing to see right now, we're launching our applications in the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, or like I said, you go to you, YouTube, David A. Smith 3D. There's a bunch of videos I did there, some of the robotics, some of the early stuff I did with Alan. Uh, but David A. Smith 3D, all one word, uh, on YouTube. You can check that out. Uh, that's probably the... The best places uh, to to see uh, uh, almost everything I've done, I've tried to create videos of and, and, Good idea. and show off. So you, you can you can learn a lot from that. Cool. Thanks, David. Well, thank you. This is really fun. It's been fun. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, that's our show for today. I'm Will Jarvis, and I'm Will's dad. Join us next week for more narratives. 